young adult class you can head to your class also at this time all right all right good morning everyone and uh, take your bibles and turn with me to the book of luke luke in chapter number two this morning is where we're going to have our lesson out of and if you have been in our adult sunday school class for the last uh, few weeks you know that we are we have been looking at the earthly life and ministry of jesus and uh, we started with um his uh pre-incarnation and so now we are up to his incarnation or uh, at the point of the birth of Jesus and a very familiar story I know uh, probably most if not everyone is somewhat familiar with the the, the birth story of of Jesus there in Bethlehem and uh, the last couple weeks we covered a couple things um, looking at the angelic announcements that led up to his birth uh, we know that there were uh, the angel uh, visited um, uh, uh, s several people. Well, uh, there was Zacharias and then uh, also Mary. Gabriel visited uh, Mary and Joseph. So we studied those announcements uh, leading up to the birth. And then uh, last week, we covered the songs of joy that came from after those announcements. And so we looked at Elizabeth there um and the song of joy there and uh, mary and zacharias briefly last week and so we now are are up to the birth of jesus and i i know this is something that certainly you know uh we'll get it we it's not typically taught or preached on uh in the month of march april really it's just a december lesson right a december message that's when we focus on it but uh, we'll get into this. It actually is maybe more appropriate for this time of the year because this time of the year is likely when uh, Jesus was born, uh, the springtime. Uh, very unlikely that he was born in uh, the winter time, which uh, he was not born on December 25th. That I'm pretty certain about, um, but that is when we uh, celebrate his birth. And we still should. We should still celebrate that and remember that. But um, we are looking at the birth of Jesus or when Jesus, God, be, uh, was uh, made in the flesh and he took on flesh. That's what the word incarnation means, to embody flesh. And, uh, and you know, the Bible is very clear. Uh, scripture tells us that God took on flesh. In fact, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, I read this last week, uh, it says this, and the word was made flesh. The word there talked about in John chapter 1 is Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is God, he didn't become God when he was born. He has always been God. He took on flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Scripture tells us that uh, uh, God became man. He took on flesh. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible once again tells us, it says this, and without great, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. And so this morning, I want us to look at this topic and study it a little bit, the birth of Jesus. And so uh, if you're in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and um, we'll just uh, begin by reading the first, the first five verses of this chapter, and we'll continue down uh, in it. But this is the, the chapter that deals with Jesus' birth there in Bethlehem. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. 
and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. We'll stop there. Why don't we ask the Lord to bless um, our time here? And, you know, as, as I, um, as we ask the Lord to bless our lesson here this morning and the time that we have, I, we have several church members that are either in the hospital right now or um, certainly need our prayers. And we prayed for them in our, our prayer meeting this morning. Brother um, Art uh, went to the hospital or the ER, or uh, maybe it was urgent care, but he was in the hospital last night. Uh, he's dealing with a, a leg issue. And if you hadn't heard, Ken Ackerman had a, a minor stroke. And so we need to be in prayer for him uh, and for his recovery there. He actually had that up in Alaska. And so he and Michelle are up there. And so he's got some um, physical therapy from that. And then uh, we know there are several others, uh, Joe and uh, Ken Connor isn't here this morning. He's probably struggling. And Dale, these are men that would normally be here. So let's ask for the Lord to bless our time here this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, to be in your house <clears throat> this morning. And we just pray for those uh, church members that are ailing right now. We think of Brother Ken uh, Ackerman. I pray for you to put your hand of, of healing over him. I pray that uh, the therapy would work uh, to get him uh, make, making a full recovery. We thank you for your protection over his life and pray for uh, for Joe, especially in the pain that he's experiencing with that liver cancer. I pray that you would work a miracle in his life. Be with Ken Connor uh, and just strengthen him as well as Dale. And there are others for Art right now as he's at urgent care. I pray that you would give the doctors wisdom. Be with those that are uh, sick this morning. I pray that you would uh, touch their bodies, heal them, and that you would strengthen us. And we thank you for those that are able to be here. I pray that you would bless our services today. Be with us right now as we study your word. I pray that you'd, it would bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's get into the lesson. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know this is very uh, familiar to most of us, but I just want to go through some scripture, bring some things out, as we study this, and the first thing, and, and it really goes um, without saying, when it dealing with the birth of Jesus, this was a stressful birth. Three points this morning. A stressful birth, first of all. And, and it was stressful because as we just read here in Luke chapter 2, we see it came at really uh, an inconvenient time. Uh, for especially Mary to be heading on such a long journey. And we read um, here in uh, these first five verses of Luke chapter 2. You know, the Bible says Mary was great with child. That means she was not in the, the first trimester of her pregnancy here. She was like, she was at the very end of it, great with child. And so this journey from Nazareth, uh, up north from where they were at, down to Bethlehem, down just going south, but it was actually, I know the Bible says uh, up here, that's um, that's speaking of uh, the height, uh, you know, uh, the elevation here. I, I think that's what it, what it says. Maybe not. Maybe I'm um, out of the city of, of Nazareth. But anyway, the journey was quite a journey. This was 90 plus miles for them. Uh, probably close to a five-day journey at best if they made good time. And Mary was great with child. A very inconvenient, stressful time in the life of Joseph and certainly Mary. But, you know, I, you have to, to see why, why, did, uh, why this happened. Well, this census decree that's talked about here in verse number one, but issued by Caesar Augustus, you understand God always has a plan. He always has a purpose. And this purpose for this timing was to fulfill Bible prophecy. Up here in Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2, this is Old Testament prophecy 
that um, that you know uh, Joseph and Mary were up in Nazareth, and G- the Bible says the Savior Jesus wasn't going to be born in Nazareth. He was going to be born in Bethlehem, and so the great you could uh, the great um, you know problem here was how do we get Mary <laughs> down to Bethlehem? Well, God had a plan. It was from the beginning. Uh, here, Caesar Augustus issued an order that everyone had to return to their, their homeland, and Joseph was of the house and the lineage of David, and David, we know, came out of Bethlehem. And so the prophecy that we see being fulfilled here, there are so many Old Testament prophecies pointing and, and uh, uh, speaking to the coming Messiah. All of them were fulfilled, and here's just one of them. Micah chapter two, or 5, verse number 2, tells us this. It says, But thou, Bethlehem, Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. We know Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He had no beginning. His goings forth, he's the eternal God. And so this is speaking of Jesus, this prophecy out of the book of Micah. But not only was the journey inconvenient, we also see that when they got there, uh, look in verse number 6. So they get down to Bethlehem, and we know that... um, Joseph and Mary, uh, the journey was certainly came at the most inconvenient time, but now we look and see that there was unavailable lodging for them. No place for Mary uh, and Joseph to relax in verse number six, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, this inn that is being talked about, um, you know, it probably, because Joseph and Mary understand this, they were not the only ones traveling to Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a very small city, um, probably one of those cities where if you were born there in Bethlehem, you do whatever you can to get out of Bethlehem, right? And I, I have a feeling that's, I mean, that's clearly that was Joseph, right? Joseph got up, he go to the big city of Nazareth or, or Jerusalem or some other city, but they had to go back to Bethlehem. And so the inn that is uh, being talked about here really was probably more of a tourist camp, but, you know, some sort of temporary shelter or a camp set up for all the pilgrims that were making their way back. And, you know, there with no room or of available Joseph and Mary we know were forced to find rest in an open courtyard there probably and you know the exact place of Christ's birth I've never been to Bethlehem uh, have you been to Bethlehem I mean they probably tell you this is where Jesus was born but the exact place is really unknown but notice the stress and uh that surrounded the birth of Jesus Christ. Certainly an inconvenient time, an inconvenient journey, no room in the end, no place. And But the other thing I want to point out here about the birth was not only was it a stressful birth, but it was a natural birth. And, you know, the birth of Jesus was as normal and as natural as any other human birth. And, you know, yes, the little Lord Jesus would have certainly cried. <laughs> it's a, pro- right, a, a natural, if you have a, a baby that's that's been delivered, been born, and it's not crying, that actually is unnatural. And so, yes, Jesus would have cried like a normal baby, and it was a normal birth. In fact, uh, you know, the fact Mary went full term, uh, you know, tells us that, this was a healthy, uh, a healthy pregnancy. Um, certainly, the fact that when Mary was able to travel f- to Bethlehem 
indicates that this was a healthy pregnancy, but it was natural. Um, the manger uh, that is talked about in verse number two, or uh, excuse me, number seven here, the manger that, as you know, it's a feeding trough for animals. And to think that the everlasting, eternal God, um, you know, uh, we sing the song, Ivory Palaces. We sing that song here, right, Chris? I think we don't. Okay, out oh, boy. Uh, it's uh, it, I'm familiar with it. It's in our hymn book. Um, but the chorus or the refrain says this. You know, to think that Jesus, God, left heaven to come down to really the most humiliating of accommodations to a manger, the feeding trough for animals, the song Ivory Palaces. Uh, you've probably, most of you I'm sure have heard it, but it says this, out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe, only his great eternal love made my Savior go. And to think that um, Jesus left heaven's glory to come to earth, and um, so this was a natural birth. Mary went full term. A manger was really just as about a nat, uh, you know, a feeding trough for animals. But I do want to point out that Jesus is called Mary's firstborn uh, here in verse number seven. It says, "And she or Mary brought forth her firstborn son." Jesus is called Mary's firstborn, and this is significant because. You know, Mary went on to have other children through through natural or human conception with Joseph. And uh, we don't need to turn there, but over in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55, uh, when Jesus was in his earthly ministry and he was uh, went back into his own country, the Bible says, and Jesus was without honor in his own country. Um, he was in the synagogue teaching and everyone was looking at Jesus as he was teaching in the synagogue, and their comment was, is not this the carpenter's son, Joseph's son? Is not his mother named Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simeon or Simon and Judas? And so Jesus had, uh, these were Jesus's, uh, technically they were his half-brothers. And so, uh, but these were, these were, sons um, that of, uh, of Mary and Joseph, Jesus's half-brothers. We know James uh, and um, Judas or, or Jude, they were uh, prominent uh, later on. Uh, James, we know, wrote the book of James. And, um, and so uh, Jesus was called Mary's firstborn. But this was a stressful birth. It was a natural birth. But it also was, and third, an announced birth. Look with me now in verse number eight. An announced birth, a special announcement here. Verse number eight, and I'll read um, down to verse number 12, back in Luke chapter two. It says, And there were at the same, uh, in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You know, the, I, the, I, the fact that these shepherds and their flocks were out in the fields at night demonstrates that Jesus was not born on December 25th, uh, which would have been during the winter. The shepherds were out at night with their flocks. And, you know, sheep were bedded down in their folds, usually between November and March. So, you know, if anything, 
The Lamb of God, Jesus, probably was born at a time in the, the spring lambing season, anywhere from late, maybe late January to uh, April. So this time of the year, <laughs> hence, you know, the perfect time to be looking at the birth of Jesus. He was probably born around this time of the year, the spring season. But we see in verse number nine, uh, verse number nine, the uh, the angelic messenger here. This uh, in this instance, the angel appeared in a glorious form, and uh, in verse number ten, we see an awesome message given by the angel here. Look in verse number ten. I want to read this again. Uh, it says, "And the angel said unto them, to the shepherds." Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, this message that we see the angels giving, this is a gospel message. And by that, it, we see that it's... It, the, the Bible uses the, the words good tidings. You know, the New Testament uh, Bible is, comes out of the Greek. And the Greek word uh, translated good tidings here. Elsewhere, it's translated as gospel. And we know the word gospel means good news or good tidings. And, you know, if you know the gospel message, isn't it good news? I mean, it is, it, there is, there, it is great news. The fact that Jesus came to earth, we're looking at that this morning, but not that, but that he later on died for our sins so that we could have salvation. He was buried and then he rose again. And we celebrate his resurrection on uh, Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. That's the good news. Now, it's understanding why he did that. Is we're all lost sinners. We all need a Savior. Jesus died for us so that we could have eternal life. And the shepherds here are giving a gospel message. Good tidings, they say. Good news. Jesus is born. Christ the Lord. And... Uh, and so, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And that that's, tells us this, this message wasn't just to the shepherds or to one certain group of people. No, this message was to all people. To all people. You understand this? Christ came to save all mankind. All of us. Not just Americans, not just Jews. He came to save everybody. And because of that, the gospel message should be preached to all mankind. Because it's for everybody. It's for all men. And there's a very clear message given here. Not only is it a good, uh, a good message or good tidings... To all people, but as you see here in verse number 11, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You know, this verse uh, makes several Old Testament statements related to prophecy of Jesus' first coming. And... Um, and actually, could I um, could I hand out some scripture references? If you would be willing to maybe just read a verse, uh, Mark, could you get Isaiah chapter nine verse six? Isaiah nine six. Um, anyone else? Shamika. Uh, Isaiah forty nine six. Forty nine six, and then uh, another one out of the book of Isaiah. One more, Tom. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. Okay, so I want, us, I, I want us to just look here at 
Luke chapter 2, verse 11, where we see this very clear message given by the angels. Unto you is born a Savior, Christ the Lord. And take you back to Old Testament prophecy that's talking about the coming Savior, and we see that if these shepherds knew their Bible, they knew exactly what the angel was telling them. Because this is Old Testament pr prophecy spoken by the prophet Isaiah. That's They're using the same language that Isaiah used. And so we can see here, so um, if you guys will just speak up. So we're, first verse, unto you is born. We see the angels say that. And so in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, the first part of that verse. For unto us a child is born. Thank you. Yeah, so the angels here, they say to the shepherds in Luke, for unto you is born this day. And again, he takes you back to Isaiah where it says unto us a child is born. And Isaiah tells us that that prophecy isn't just any child. It's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Okay, and so we see that correlation there. And so this very clear message given by the angels. And um, then we see that it's there's going to be a, a, a baby born, but it's a savior, a savior. And we see that spoken of in the city of David, a savior. And so uh, Shemika, Isaiah 49, verse 6. Thank you. Yeah, so that verse that she just read talks about a light to the Gentiles. And it goes on, it says, um, their salvation to all the ends of the earth, a Savior. And so notice it says Gentiles, not just Jews, Gentiles. It's to everybody. So a very clear message. And then um, one uh, final verse, Christ the Lord. So over in Isaiah chapter 11, in verses 1 and 2. Can you also read verse 10? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so again, the prophecy there by the prophet Isaiah talking about out of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. David was born in Bethlehem. Joseph was of the lineage and household of, of David there. And so we see that, and then the, the uh, angel says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David. David's father was Jesse, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so you can see the connection that the angels are giving in this, in this clear message, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. The stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots, as Tom read uh, there in Isaiah chapter 11. And so this was a special, a special announcement. Um, but not only that, it was also a spectacular announcement. This wasn't just, you know, one angel coming to one person in private. Like some of those, uh, like when Gabriel came to Mary or Joseph, right? Uh, or we saw that other angel come to Zacharias to tell him it was in the, uh, in the, when Zacharias was making offering there. He was, it was just him. This was spectacular. And so let's look in verse number 13, getting back to Luke chapter two, Luke chapter two and verse number 13. It says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, 
praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This was spectacular. It's one thing to read it. I think if we could see this, we would just be, we would see the heavenly hosts making this announcement. This this was spectacular. The Bible says a heavenly multitude, probably too many to count. They were praising God there in verse um, 13, the Bible says. Keep your spot here in Luke, but let's turn back to the book of Psalm. The book of Psalm 103. Psalm 103 in the Old Testament. And verse number 20. You know, part of why angels were created, they are created beings. Part of why angels were created is to praise God. That's why they were created. We know that uh, in the book of the Revel- uh, uh, in, uh, Revelation, as John was given that vision of what the throne room of God looks like, we know that there are angels that were created where they, the seraphim surround the throne of God. And what are they saying all day, every day? <clears throat> holy, holy, holy. They, that's their job. To bring, to bring praise and glory to the only one who deserves that praise and glory. And so that's what this heavenly multitude was doing there out in the field. So over in Psalm chapter 103, look in verse number 20. Um, it says this, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Angels, that's what they do. They bless the Lord, ye his angels. And so, um, and then uh, turn over to chapter 148. So right towards the end of Psalm, Psalm 148. Verse number two, we see the same thing being talked about with angels. This is what they do. They praise God. They lift God up. In verse number two, Psalm 148, verse two, Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. And we get back to Luke chapter two, and we see these angels, these angels doing the exact same thing, praising God. Suddenly, there was the angel, a multitude, and heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so this was a spectacular announcement. First of all, we see this heavenly multitude appear. But in verse 14, we see this hopeful message. It's a message of hope because they, the angels were singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. A message of peace and goodwill toward men. Um, ter- uh, one final verse I'd like for you to turn to, Titus. Titus chapter 3. Let's turn over there. Sorry, I didn't have it up on the screen for you, but Titus chapter 3. It's after Timothy, I believe, right? Or is it before Timothy? Oh, no, it's after. (laughs) I was questioning myself. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 4. A message of peace and goodwill toward men. We see this. And this is this is what God has done for you and I today. It says, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This was a message of peace and goodwill toward men. And we see this talked about, this same kindness and love of God, that he would leave heaven's glory to come to earth to die and pay our sin debt so that we could ha- be heirs with Christ and have eternal life. Um, Titus talks about you. You know, um, there is, you know, we um, we use the King James Version Bible here in this church, and we preach and, and, and read that and uh, out of this book. And there is reasons for, the, uh, for that, for sure. And um, we won't get into them this morning, but... This verse here in Luke chapter 2, verse number 14, is one of those instances where you see a very uh, clear trans, uh, you can see um, a trans, uh, a perversion of God's word take place in many popular modern translations. And you have to understand, most modern perversions of God's word, they follow what's known as the critical text which corrupts, uh, reflects a really corrupt reading um, and in the manuscripts and without getting into the Greek and uh, all of that. But um, in this verse, here in verse uh, 14, the Greek word for goodwill is altered in the translation of many of these uh, corrupt uh, versions. And it was... Um, the critical text altered the reading, and they did it by adding one extra letter in um, it change in uh, one extra letter to the Greek word, and that extra letter changes the case of the noun. And what it does is it translates out of the Greek uh, to read "peace on earth to men of goodwill." Let me say that again. Peace on earth to men of goodwill. And for example, the English Standard Version, a very popular Bible version that that is used today in many churches. For example, when you read this verse in the ESV, it reads this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those who with whom he is pleased. So let me read the King James Version. It says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Versus, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And this stems just from the the, the text that these corrupt translations stem from you know it's very it's similar in the niv and the nasb other versions are read the same way guess why i bring this up is the doctrine of salvation is perverted when you if, if you if you translate it that corrupt way um you know uh and so uh, you have to be careful you have to be careful um, one final thing, we're running out of time. This was a special announcement, a spectacular announcement. But then finally, I want to end with this. It was a shared announcement. Let's just read. I'll read down uh, verse 15. I'll read to verse 20. It says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem to see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard of of it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Last point this morning. 
it was a shared announcement. What we see here is the shepherds, or we see saints witnessing. They, the shepherds experienced the event for themselves and then shared the good news with everybody that they could. And, you know, that is exactly what you and I are to do. You and I are to do the exact same thing. These shepherds, they found Jesus. And then we see, after finding Jesus, the next thing we see them doing is sharing the good news. And then we see them glorifying and praising God. You know, it, that is exactly what you and I are to do. If you find Jesus, you come to know him as your Lord and Savior. That's good news. There's joy. And that joy ought to be shared with others. And then we are to go on the rest of our life glorifying and praising the God who saved us. I think of, I was going to have us turn over to Acts chapter 20. As I was reading this, I was thinking of Peter and John. Um, Peter and John, after we uh, the healing of that lame man by the temple. And then uh, shortly after that, the Sadducees grabbed them, arrested them, brought them in. And Peter and John just started having to um, e explain what was going on and um, and. Uh, the Bible tells us that they just could not help but speak of the things that they had seen and heard. And they, uh, we see in verse number 20, well, early on we know that they were filled, the, the church uh, on the, that day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that wasn't the time when they got saved. We know today when a person trusts Christ as their Savior, they are filled with the Holy Ghost. But we know back then in Acts chapter 1, uh, the Lord filled his church there on the day of Pentecost with the Holy Ghost. So that's salvation. They met, you know, or uh, not, let me, they, that was not salvation for them. But today it is. When a person's filled with the Holy Ghost, that's when they have salvation, the indwelling spirit. But then we see shortly after that, sharing the good news. Peter and John could not help but speak of the things. And then we see in verse 21 of Acts chapter 20, them going about their way, they got released, and they were glorifying God. Same pattern as with these shepherds. They found Jesus, they shared the good news, and they glorified and praised God. I hope today, if you're saved, you found Jesus. You ought to share that good news, much like these shepherds did. People can't shut you up about what you've, what's happened in your life. The good things that have happened in your life, the good news, the good tidings. And then make sure you go on your, your way glorifying and praising God, just like these shepherds, just like Peter and John did there in Acts chapter 20. And so we're out of time, and so we'll end right there. But Next week, I want to get into the infancy of Jesus. We looked at his birth um, this morning, but then we're, there are four events that occurred shortly after Jesus' birth that I want to start looking at, and we'll start that next week. So you are dismissed.